My name is John Miller. I am co-director with Leslie Green of Storyhouse Ithaca. And welcome to Black Consciousness Explorations in Ithaca with Dr. Nia Nunn. I'm so excited about this program. And so I will be quick. Uh, Storyhouse what, you ask? Storyhouse Ithaca is a new organization devoted to bringing people together around stories, telling stories, listening to stories, talking about stories, creating stories together and not just around the campfire sorts of stories, but oral history and poetry and theater and song and journalism and every other way of communicating ideas and experience. Mainly though, we're in it for the bringing people together part, even if that has to be in cyberspace at times. Uh, Storyhouse Ithaca is a project of the Center for Transformative Action. Today, we are launching two new series one is called Storyhouse Tuesdays, in which we eventually hope to stake a claim on your Tuesdays at around 5.30 for all sorts of cool things uh, like this and other programming. Um, we're, we're, we're starting gradually, but we, uh, we hope to do a lot of programming on Tuesdays at this time. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Join our mailing list on our website, storyhouseithaca.org, if you haven't already, and we'll keep you posted. Uh, the second thing we're launching tonight is called the Placemakers series, and uh, that's just the, like a show and tell for folks and groups who are using art and culture to build community here uh, and elsewhere, too. And we've got a bunch of interesting people lined up, and we believe we have found the perfect person to kick this off, and Leslie will introduce her. Hello, I am Leslie Green. Before I introduce our incredible speaker, I want to tell you a little bit of how this meeting is, how this event is going to go. Um, Dr. Nia will talk for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer section. And then following that, I know we said, maybe we said <laughs> that it was going to be just an hour long. And so if that's what you're counting on and you got to go, you got to go. But if you can stick around, we would love it if um, you can, and then we'll divide you into small breakout rooms at for conversations because our idea is like let's make this as close as possible to an event where we're actually in the same place and can talk to one another so um yeah that it, it won't be that close to that but we're we're doing what we can so now on to our speaker um many of you know her she's an Ithaca native but also because she's an Ithaca powerhouse um, Dr. Nia Nunn is Associate Professor in the Department of Education at Ithaca College. She's President of the Board of Directors of Southside Community Center, and she's Director of CUMEP, the Community Unity Music uh, Education Program, among other, among other um, things that she does. And I think you're going to hear more about some of those things. But she's an educator, performer, scholar, artist, mother. Um, and her work honors and centers a curriculum of Black liberation and self-determination. She's a scholar and creator of programs designed to empower and uplift the voices, the artistic and self-expression and literacy of youth, particularly Black youth and especially Black girls. Um, I have had the really good fortune to be able to watch Dr. Nia at work at, with Southside Community Center kids and Ithaca College students, and she is dynamic and inspiring to, for them and for me. <laughs> so we're so glad that she's inaugurating our Placemaker series um, and that she'll return to it again in March. Um, more on that later. So welcome and thank you so, so much for being here, Dr. Nia Nunn. Let me spotlight you. Hello, greetings everyone. It is an absolute joy to be here, um, to have this opportunity to engage in storytelling as one of my most favorite things ever. Um, super thanks to Beauty and the Beast, Mitch and Martha. As a child, I think I was a second grader when they first came to Central Elementary School and gave me this story, this super scary story. And I'll never forget that like little ounce of, of glorious power with love um, that I experienced in telling the story, I just, rem I, I, I remember it now and I am 40 years old, y'all. I was like, 
seven and the way in which the audience leaned in at the same time, I was like, what is that? I want that again. It was everything. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful. There are so many folks here that have joined us that I know. It's wonderful to see you. But then there are also some names that are unfamiliar. And so I'm super excited to meet you as well. Um, it's an honor always to, to make new friends. And so I'm going to share some slides, but really engage you in a few videos um, that help to tell the story of this work. And I'm just really, really excited. So I'll begin with what I like to call a, a bit of a, a credential collage, if you will, right? Just to offer a little snapshot as it relates to the multiple head wraps that I wear. Um, and so I'll start somewhat at the center at the top. I am a professor, as was mentioned, at Ithaca College. So I have the glorious responsibility of preparing teachers. Um, and it is an extreme joy. Um, I make it relevant to a little bit of everything that I do. So not only am I preparing Ithaca College students to be teachers, um, but I'll show you a little bit later how I work with four-year-olds to prepare even them to be teachers at their age. So it's extremely special. Um, my background is in early childhood education, so I went to Clark Atlanta University, that's where I received my BA and then immediately went after my PhD at Michigan State University, that's where I, I received that degree in school psychology. Um, and so I have these images because they just are representative of, of who I am in multiple ways. So you'll see on the right, I emphasize my sorority, uh, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Um, and I, I emphasize my sorority just because it is a part of my heartbeat, right? Um, you know, sisterhood, service, and scholarship are central to my being. And so while I engaged in officially became a member in adulthood, um, my mother is also uh, a member of the sorority. And so I was, I was born and raised and nurtured into this concept of scholarship, sisterhood, and service. In that top right is the Sankofa bird. And, and later on in the presentation, you'll hear about the Sankofa bird from a young person. So I'm gonna leave that at there. Um, jumping around this collage, just it just seems easier for me to just put it all in one space, so bear with me. Um, right under Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated is Beverly J. Martin, um, the elementary school that I attended as a child, but also where I started my career as a school psychologist. So there's nothing, you know, like walking through the halls as a grown up, you know, just stepping around my elementary school alma mater um, is significantly special. Other elements of me that I think are critical, particularly if you we haven't met and we haven't connected, um, additional elements of my heartbeat include Southside Community Center, which I'll be sharing um, in some detail with you all. And um, at Southside was where I was born and raised, essentially, a historically Black community center that's dear to my heart. As was mentioned, I serve today on the leadership team of a group of, of mostly black women. We have black men as well, who are guiding and leading our youth and nurturing our community. So through that, um, COMEP, my performing arts work um, is a central piece of that. New right there in the center, y'all, is um, a consultation work that I've just started um, more recently. Uh, I am all about service, all about giving and, and, and just making that happen. Um, but more recently, I've been learning about the creative ways in which I can turn this passion um, that I have uh, into profit and actually, um, you know, shift from working for free <laughs> all the time. While it's a significant part of my journey um, I'm just learning what's what's possible in the world. And so I'm so grateful for that. I have a little bit of feedback. Um, I don't know if anyone can help me out with that, uh, but I will just move on to just also acknowledge my children. You saw my youngest one um, who some of you 
saw him say hello real quick before we started. Um, but these are my three boys, my three boys that my, my oldest one is actually an adult. Um, and so it's just something that I like to share as I'm meeting new people, um, but also just to give some others who do know me an update, look how big they are, like these giant human beings in my world. Um, and I'm, I'm truly, truly grateful. Uh, motherhood is, is, is definitely my gig. I also wanted to emphasize that my audience is typically that of, you know, 300 two to 12 year olds. Um, so bear with me if there are moments where you feel like you're in third grade, um, work with it, rock with it. It's an energy that I um, enjoy sharing, but particularly as I'm engaging folks in critical thought. Um, so today is an opportunity um, for me to share with you the ways in which I exercise um, Black consciousness. As I begin this work, I actually have a couple questions for you all, and you may choose to just think about it. You may choose to write about it, but later on in the program, you'll have an opportunity to process in breakout rooms. Um, but uh, what I want to present to you as I'm engaging you in uh, how I exercise Black consciousness and what this is really about, is I like to have people begin with this. Um, it's an opportunity to reflect on what you were taught. So each and every one of us in your spaces, go back to childhood. Go back as young as you possibly can, right? And, and think about, try to remember what you learned, what you were taught, explicitly and or implicitly about Black people. And so just giving people a minute to just process that, not reaching out for any answers right now, but just giving you an opportunity to think about, to remember what stories come up for you. How young can you go as it relates to processing this teaching the messages, what did it sound like? What did it look like? What did it feel like? And to go a bit further, again, later on, we'll, we'll, we'll bring this back up. Um, but the question is, what are you doing with what you were taught? How, how has that impacted the dynamics of your relationship to Blackness, your relationship with Black people in adulthood. So thinking about those messages and then bringing some of your thoughts and reflections to today, to now. And then what I'd like to do is engage you in some storytelling that essentially answers the question for me, right? So what? What, um, what were the conversations? What did I learn? I um, was born and raised, and many of you on this call know my parents very well, um, the two very pro-Black individuals. Um, I was raised in a household to absolutely love Blackness and Black people. Um, I oftentimes tell the story about, you know, having Black Barbie dolls and Cabbage Patch dolls and having the whiz memorized before I even knew there was a Wizard of Oz. I was like, who's this white girl? They keep calling Dorothy. Um, and so the ways in which my parents put significant energy into, I think they decided they graduated from Ithaca College and said they wouldn't stay and be townies, but lo and behold, that's exactly what they did. And decided that if they were gonna raise me in a predominantly white community, that they would be intentional about ensuring that I have a relationship with this identity that is in fact healthy. So those are the roots. And some of those roots I illustrate by showing images of Girl Scouts. Okay, I'll actually start with this picture. Um, so this is me at Southside Community Center. At the, it was a predominantly black Girl Scout troop. I am the one on the far right 
in that blue apron dress, um, the, the fancy bang to the side, thank you, mother, and chewing on my fingers, that's me, okay? And then if you look in that front row, all the way to the left, I almost wanna look at like Glenn Christopher's face to see a reaction to the fact that this young lady second at the end here with the orange bow, um, that's Siobhan Bunch, our current executive director um, at, at Southside Community Center. And so this is us as, as little girls, our, our, our mothers, all of our mothers here decided that, you know, it was critical that we had each other, that we could navigate and explore and reflect on the reality of our identity. And especially since many of us were off in school in predominantly white spaces, um, uh, as in, in their friendship, they found it significant and necessary uh, to bring us together. And so I just want to acknowledge Southside Community Center by showing the visual, um, the historical element um, of the, the beginning, the early days of the building, and then to give you an image of the building today as we are getting closer and closer to honoring our uh, centennial. And so I was raised in this space to recognize that I was growing up in a space of greatness, right? The history, the story, uh, the Francis Harper women um, and Jacqueline Elizabeth Melton Scott, like she uh, really emphasized and taught in various ways um, why it was so critical for us to not only know our history, but to go even deeper, to teach her and to teach others um, about the space. So many of us in our leadership roles, we are, are committed to continuing to learn, but also to, to make history. Um, but I just wanted to take a moment to, to honor Mama Scott, um, who was once an executive director of Southside Community Center, but also a primary mentor of mine as well. And so I want to jump into sharing the two examples of the ways in which I uh, bring this concept of Black consciousness to, to life. And it ends up being ultimately a black consciousness curriculum that I end up exercising through these two avenues that I wanna share with you today with some video clips and um, do a little bit more processing. So um, COMEP, the Community Unity Music Education Program, as well as the program that I helped to give birth to at Southside Community Center called A Black Girl Alchemy. So what's a central to this, and I'm not going to get all super academic, but I do want to highlight the ways in which this is directly linked to my research and my craft. Um, really, uh, I find research to be healing, um, primarily focusing on qualitative research, but the story, the narrative, um, the themes that emerge. But one of my favorite things to do is enroll the girls as scholars and researchers themselves. So spending some time with the creative works I'll share. Um, I didn't put much energy into the last slide, um, but the history, the ways in which um, we are able to teach girls and our my college women their history, um, and the relationship between what they experience oftentimes on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's linked to some historic uh, realities. Gathering sisterhood, sister circles are a central part of the work, as well as removing um, economic barriers, uh, really taking the girls places um, and, and answering wishes as much as possible because we encourage them to dream. Rooted in the work are a series of research questions. Right? I really want to be able to zap into the psychological and emotional well-being of um, many of the young women and girls that I work with. And so spending some time naming the ways in which we're able to do that is a central part of the work, um, as well as just being explicit about identity throughout their, their wellness journey. And connected to that curriculum, writing curriculum, is a critical part of the work. 
I'm just going to fly through a few slides just to give you a sense for what some of the work looks like um, and feels like. But in addition to that, I have a short video, a special new video um, to share with you. And I'm super, super excited. So bear with me as I get us there. All right, so this is Black Girl Alchemy. You'll see some additional leaders of the work, um, local artist Anne-Marie Zwack, um, Rasana Malone, Kayla Matos, uh, Dadaisi Marte. Um, and what's so really beautiful about this, and many of you will smile, um, many of these women are, you know, they're 10, 15 years younger than me, and I'm able to just pass the mic at a whole nother level. Um, their leadership is um, it's been amazing. And so this is just a reflection on some of the work that we did from, from 2020. The culture of Black girlhood and its roots and history has this self-defining nature. One of my contributions to the space is the Black Girl Alchemist philosophy. The work is a curriculum of liberation designed to combat historical and current social conditions negatively impacting Black girls and women. BGA recognizes that when the community prioritizes the voices and creative works of Black girls and women, everybody benefits. We had planned to do another mosaic right here on the north side, just brainstorming some ideas. It only took a second to acknowledge and recognize that we wanted to honor Mr. Bajor Gandhi. We started off doing some drawings and exploring what does Black joy mean to you? What does Black joy mean to me? And expressions of honoring the Black body. When you think of this concept of Black joy and the ways in which we are here to honor de jour, what images come to mind? I started to think about different words. I have felt and experienced while being a young Black woman. Um, so whether it's love, pain, fear, hope, joy, things like that. And so this idea of Black Girl Alchemist, right, this whole magical concept, it allows us to give ourselves permission to name the beauty of our existence. So that despite whatever negative messages she is constantly having exposure to, that there is this sort of take or this affirmation, reassuring of oneself. The process is magical. Without realizing what's going on, you are transforming. You're transforming yourself when you are a mentor, but you're also transforming these girls. This project has been something near and dear because de jour is my nephew. When it takes a community to raise a child, that's our nephew. That's our cousin. That's our son. That's our daughter. That's our people. One of the things that I'm really proud of is the concentric circles of community that were engaged in the creative making of this. Each tile represents someone's original design, their own artwork in response to Dijour's life. We are here today to say thank you as a community to the downtown Ithaca Children's Center for allowing Dejour to be who he was.
are super, super excited, super proud of that work and being able to share it with folks um, finally. And just major, major thanks to our, our supporters and, and funders and sponsors of, of that work. I think I saw George Ferrari on the 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 screen as well a few others um many folks that have been in in significant support um and and so i want to really be sure to honor time and what am i doing right now what i'm doing is i'm sharing with you um the ways in which i exercise both my individual identity and my collective identity at the same time right so the way my my personality my flavor the performing arts elements of me um but the sacred the, the the sacred realities around um my identity as as a black woman um but particularly as a a, a teacher and leader of this work so one of the things that i want to do is i want to show you what teaching these concepts um, this concept of Black consciousness through Black joy, um, what it looks like with young people. And so this is COMEP, Community Unity Music Education Program, one of our lessons in preparing these young teachers. Dr. Dr. Man, the writer Bell Hook argued that loving Blackness is an act of political resistance because we all have internalized racism regardless of the color of our skin, which operates to devalue blackness. But she argues that black people need to love themselves not in spite of their blackness, but because of their blackness. teach our young people about interrupting anti-blackness, right? And so this is the beginning of a lesson utilizing bell hooks, um, Dr. Bettina Love. And with her work, um, I wrote this rhyme that one of our babies does. that gives you a little taste of what the lesson looks like. Um, and then I think one of my favorite things are the messages that I get from families um, that, that illustrate uh, the impact or the continued teaching. And so this is little Muna teaching her little sister in the back seat. Yes, 
Yes, indeed. All right. And so I think there's just one more piece that I want to share with you before we dive into um, doing a little processing, a little question and answer. Um, so I don't want to rush, but there's, let's see, forgive me, let me see. So just to give you a sense for just a little bit of what, what COMEP looks like real quick. Are we ready? Are we ready? Um, in the morning, just the movement, the joy. We have heavy, hard conversations with these young people. But bringing them together early, the flavor of kindness allows us to dig deep and have some pretty heavy, heavy conversations with these young people, okay? So that's what it looks like right, right down there at, at Southside Community Center. But really quickly, I would love to share with you, um, we experimented this past summer. Um, we plan to be back at Southside Community Center this summer, but this past summer, um, we got creative and we created Kamep in the parking lot of West Village. And so I just wanna give you a taste of what that looks like as well before we dive into um, the question and answer portion of our evening. <laughs> thing you've done in camp so far? I think it was the meetings. What about the meetings? Uh, all the songs. a little bit over, but that's all right. I know you will forgive me. Um, just wanted to squeeze in a couple additional goodies to help tell the story. But remember, this is part one, right? There will be a part two, and hopefully we'll be live in person together. Um, and hopefully some of the fantastic uh, young people that you just had exposure to will join us as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your listening. And um, to you all, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nia, so much. And so um, we'd love to take questions from all of you. You can put them in chat. You can, un you can unmute yourself and ask a question out loud. You can raise your hand, Zoom-like. Um, 
do, uh, probably don't raise your hand in, in real life because we won't see it. Um, but yeah, so let's, we'll, we'll try just like ask your questions any old way and we'll see how that goes. And if we have to just move to the chat, we'll do that. But uh, thank you, that was beautiful. Um, so yeah, do we have some questions. Questions, questions. Hi, it's so nice to see all your beautiful faces. Hi. <laughs> I'm being nosy. I'm looking at your faces right now. <laughs> it's on the screen. Hey, hey. Wonderful. Miss Lisa, my friend. I, I to jump in. I'm not sure I really have a question, but I um I wanna <laughs> it seemed like no one was gonna jump in. So um I, uh, it was so great. Some of these things I haven't seen and some of them I haven't. I remember distinctly being at the Kumat performance when the Black is Beautiful um, mm -hmm. and when the young lady was reciting the, the beautiful song. And I, I just remember thinking because we had just had Bettina Love there at the store and you'd had her at Southside and she'd been at the college and watching how you took something that was like an academic concept and brought it to life in real time with the children and they could really incorporate it, it was just so inspiring. Um, and it's a model that I, I like to think of. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lisa. <laughs> we have a question from Penn Hackney in the chat. How has your community work had to adapt for the pandemic? Mm, oh, that's a beautiful, beautiful question. Um, so interestingly enough, if you look up Kamep Ithaca on YouTube, we actually did a virtual Kamep 2020. And I act, I think I saw him jump in here, but my team, my team is so dope. My team, our team is incredible. And I think I saw John Kiefner jump on here. And John and I, we spent so much time coming up with these videos. Please watch these videos, okay? Probably about 20, 30 minutes each of them. And, and we just, um, what I was able to do is just like map out the depth of the curriculum to incorporate some of the black consciousness work that we had done for Juneteenth at Southside. Um, so not only did we offer virtual uh, come up, but we had uh, Friday gatherings outdoors. Um, and we have a bunch of video of that dancing outdoors with some kids and hula hoops. You know, we had a bubble song about social, uh, the uh, physical distancing far before the pandemic in our lesson about consent and touch and space. Um, so we have been doing that for a while. So it's fun to incorporate that into the work. And then what else did we do, John? We we ran, we dropped off um, gifts to uh, people's houses, the front door, um, hula hoops, books for the curriculum. So we kind of did mini lessons on people's front doorsteps. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then I think with what happened last summer, at Southside, we were working on a literacy camp. And as Kamep, we were gonna do like these festivals, these like pop-up um, adventures all over Ithaca. And that really didn't work out economically. That just, it just didn't make sense. Um, and so I was talking to Kat, who is one of my little friends in West Village and talked about doing a day at West Village. She was like, a day? What do you mean a day? She's like, why wouldn't you do all 16? And we were like, fine, we'll do all 16. And so then we, it was Kat that said, you need to do all 16 days right here. We'll just, you know, and with a few seven and eight year olds, we mapped out a camp in the parking lot and it was, and it was phenomenal. Um, so yeah, so what did we do for the pandemic? We just, we got creative, we didn't stop. Um, and I think what was significant in the pandemic you know, with with the the level of engagement of racial consciousness or racial reckoning, um, this is work we've been doing, right? So there was a way in which you know some of our babies had had exposure to and have been engaged in this black consciousness conversation for years, for five years, for for eight years, and so those are you know eight year olds or you know ten year olds and um, fifteen year olds that we saw during the time period, like, where has everybody been? You know, many, many of our young people 
were fully, fully engaged in, in the conversation and not only engaged in the work, but, but able to, to teach as well. Um, we have a raised hand, Kelly. Kelly, Holt. yes, forgive me for taking some time to get through that. Yeah, I welcome your, your question or comment. Hi, Hi. I'm from Delaware, excuse me, because I'm cycling right now. Shameless plug to the uh, uh, um, Major Taylor, which is That's named right. after the first black professional cyclist, 1899. But um, I just wanted to speak to the fact of a lot of your memories of growing up. I'm about to stop. A lot of the memories you had growing up. I remember a time in which, gosh, I had my first black Barbie. And I remember begging my parents in the middle of the store to get me the black cabbage patch kid. It had just come out. I mean, I had, I, I threw a whole tantrum, me and my sister, because <clears throat> we had only seen white ones. Yeah. And I was begging them. I said, I need one so yeah. badly. I remember my dad said, and they were so expensive back then. And I remember my dad saying, you know what? You do need it. And I remember him getting it. And I just think about, um, Growing up with my family, my grandfather was in sharecropping times. And so he really was not able to vocalize what he went through because there was so much pain behind it um, in, in the family. And he's just now starting to talk about those things. And I feel that, um, you know, I miss so many of those opportunities, but I do commend you for allowing your parents to deposit in you and, and you depositing into others, um, it definitely encourages me and makes me realize it's never too late to still instill in my children and still um, touch others with our own um, community, our beautiful treasure, our beautiful history. Um, and so I was thankful for her friend, Terrell, that uh, sent me your link so I could listen to you and you have touched me in such a way. And I'm just thankful for you uh, just sharing every bit uh, black girls alchemy. I mean, I'm just blown away. And so I just wanted to thank you for allowing God to use you and just, um, just express to you how much it is appreciated and needed in our culture. And just thank you. Thank you. Mm. So, so good. Thank you, Miss Kelly. I really, truly appreciate that. And I have every intention on cycling with you this next <laughs> July. <laughs> I'm looking at Glenn because he's going to hold me to it. Yes, I'll <laughs> be looking for you. Um, oh, what a joy. You all coming to Ithaca. I mean, let me tell you, we're still bragging about the fact that we had, you know, almost 300 Black cyclists here in Ithaca, New York, honoring Major Taylor and um, Harriet Tubman for the Harriet Tubman ride. So I'm, I'm just, I'm looking forward to your return. And there was nothing like it. So we're just, we're so grateful. Dr. Nia, I see two hands up, but yes. first I see in the chat, um, um, Turo Bradley asked, what can we expect in round two? And I think that's like the March 22nd date. What, what do you got planned for that? Yes, yes. Well, interestingly enough, um, we actually, I have this impromptu winter camp, camp going on next week, trying something new, you know, I'm all about it. And so we're going to do three days of, of, um, come up four to seven at Southside. And then we have a performance at Ithaca College on Thursday night for the Black History Month concert. And so I'll try and make sure you get footage of all of that because the hope is that then it will lead to some kind of fundraiser, maybe on the stage at the State Theater. That's an additional head wrap I've added to my life. I'm also on the board of the State Theater these days. So I'm really excited about, um, about utilizing that stage. Um, but yeah, by March 22nd, which is so beautiful, I, I say all that to say that they will have a piece. They'll have a new piece um, from the winter work next week. I've got G. Kwan coming back to Ithaca. Some of you all, look at you, yes. I was like, look, you can come back home for three days um so he's coming back we've got the team and it's just a big deal even as the grown-ups we we see come up as an opportunity to be six years old again as well um and uh and be six-year-old teachers <laughs> um so 
Um, March 22nd, the hope is that it is in person, that we're at Southside, we're in, in, in safely in the gym, perhaps. Um, but if it ends up being virtual, it will be lovely as well, because I'll make sure that you get to see the update, that you get to see um, the dynamics, the different levels of, of engagement that are, are real. Um, but yes, so that is that is something that we can we can look forward to. And some of what I do or what I plan will come from what what happens with this, right? I'd love to invite some questions. I'd like to invite or get a sense for what folks do with the work that we do. Um, and that will help to set the stage for what's what's possible um, next time. It may be a little uh, piece of reading or something that folks wanna engage in beforehand that um, just because for me, everything is, I'm a scientist practitioner, right? It's, it's theory and practice. They're just intertwined. Um, so I'm happy to share um, based on what folks are are interested in, Mr. Mr. Jonathan, hello! Wonderful to see your face. It's so nice to see you as well. So nice to meet you. Um, first of all, I have to tell you, my brother has a bicycle that we believe belonged to Major Taylor. It was found in a basement right around the corner from where he grew up in my grandmother's house. So you know, it's a little bit of a family story. We don't really know, but anyway, I do have a question for you. Yes, There's, sorry, that's a big yeah. deal. And I'm looking at Mr. Glenn Christopher. We'll talk about that later because I'm going to have to connect you <laughs> okay. all. Anyway, go ahead. What are you saying? <laughs> um, you know, there's just the videos. There's so much joy in everyone's faces and in, in, in you know, everyone who participated in, in, the, in the videos. And I'm just wondering, like, you obviously bring a tremendous amount of joy and energy to what you do. But what, how do you create that kind of joy in a parking lot somewhere? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question because it's just, we bring ourselves everywhere we go, right? Like, I think one of my questions is about you know, how we exercise your individual and your collective self, your collective identity, um, and bringing this sense of joy as you, you witness, but also um, this sense of, of, of joy connected to my, our like collective identity. So I guess my answer to that is, yeah, you just, you, we, 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 we brought, ourselves Kamep can can happen anywhere because Kamep is not just a, a a a thing or even just a curriculum it's a way of being um and 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 you can see it you can see it when we see each other out spaces there's this this glorious i have some really amazing relationships with 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 two-year-olds all the way to to teens um just because we make this commitment uh to be amazing to ourselves and one another and we get cheesy about it like we get corny we make it a big deal um and i think what was striking for me this past summer um it warmed my heart was we were able to just collect a bunch of a bunch of young people particularly teens that just just like wanted something to do they just came outside like what is this right um and it warmed my heart in a completely different way watching the 12 to 17 year old young black men engaging our babies and modeling their joy and and letting themselves be silly and loving and 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 just their true selves in the space um and 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 working closely with my father and the way they on, were you know honoring him honoring their their elder um it, it's a multi-generational space of liberation and by space i mean philosophy as well uh just a true way of being we say we overdose on happiness um just for a little bit you know we say just try it to see what it's like 
And that oftentimes when somebody is not treating you well, if somebody is being mean to you or whatever the case may be, it's likely because they are not feeling good about themselves. And so there's this level of compassion that is rooted in all things the whole way through and self-compassion. I would say that I'm an, a ridiculous extrovert. So of course, all the little other little extroverts, we bounce off of each other like nuts, which is wonderful. But I have found that, you know, we, over the years, there are ways to get creative with honoring the quiet ones, honoring the, more of the, the introverted babies. So at circle time at the end, we acknowledge people that made a new friend, a friend, um, and we do cartwheels about that. But then we have this thing where everybody is required, and this is like a three and a half hour experience. Everyone is required to compliment at least two people, two people, that's your job. And it's not about what they're wearing, what they look like, no material stuff. Compliment them on who they are being right? And cut, like do that. And that's where our introverts shine. We get into circle time and we hear about the most quiet ones making their rounds, making their quiet rounds to really compliment and honor each other. So yeah, it's, it's, there's a whole lot of love. And I think it's like, yeah, we love the impact on the kids and their families. It's beautiful, but it's phenomenal to see what happens with the grownups too. <laughs> what happens with grownups. Um, it's very healing. It's a very healing experience for, for all of us uh, throughout the ages. And this was founded and built, created um, by my father. And so I just kind of, you know, I just, I do what I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that, all that joy with us. It's so a much joy. Good time to have it. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Nia, there's a, a hand up from Brooks Minor, but yeah. first I see um, a couple que like Kumap questions like, is there still space in the winter Kumap? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. that's good to know. Um, how long has it been running? And so then have any of your kids gone on to teaching or education or has it not like yes. been long enough yeah. for that? Definitely. Oh, I mean, and that's what's it's so, so dope to be old enough to watch people turn into giant adults themselves. Um, yeah, that we are, we have a, a, a system, you see us all in the colors. And some of that is about safety, right? Just about like a uniform. And as much as the work is about dismantling hierarchies, we have a hierarchy of leadership. And we are the big bad green shirts. Those of us who are a lot of the, like the teachers, the head teachers, the leaders, the college students, our Ithaca college students are all green shirts. But then we had red shirts, which are the teenagers. Sometimes back in the day, they were our yes workers. Um, and so they are the red shirts. Those are like the grown up teenagers that have a huge responsibility. And that's a code for young people that that's a point person for safety and to check in with. And so we have to nurture their journey. And then my 18 year old, when he was nine was like, look, there needs to be another level of leadership. And so he came up with the yellow shirt and the yellow shirt is like our CIT. They're like the little leaders. They're the models, high expectations for their performance, all of that. And there is nothing <laughs> more exciting than hearing parents tell stories or even listening to a little kid talk about their dreams, how they can't wait to be a yellow shirt. One day I'm gonna be a red shirt. One day I'll be a green shirt. And we honor all shirts, all of the rainbow, right? Um, but the significance, like it is an honor to where our leaders, we make it a big deal. When you earn the yellow shirt, like that, that's, um, we have a whole ceremony about it. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, so that that I now I forgot your question. I'm so excited about now I'm on my yellow shirt. <laughs> I think you you totally answered it with that. Um, um, and so maybe Brooks um, question. Yes, Brooks. Sure, Hello. sure. Hi, Nia. Hi. Um, so I'm I'm curious how you navigate getting Ithaca College students involved in this work. Uh, you know, as an Ithaca College faculty member myself. Yes. I'm I'm well aware that most of our students are white. And, and so like, how do you approach that? And um, how do you draw students in? Yes, yes, beautiful question. Um, one of my strategies is that I actually literally don't separate things. Like I teach 
educational psychology. And by that, I mean, I teach educational psychology and almost, and there's so much that I teach on the Hill that I'm like, okay, how do you break that down to a four-year-old? Right. And so it ends up being actual material. And some of you know this, some of you know, my Howard Gardner songs and, my, you know, uh, Abraham Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs. And, um, and so I end up utilizing Kamep to teach. I end up showing them how, uh, what I taught them, you know, the ways in which it can be broken down. Um, in fact, even today, I was able to teach, if you look up True Joy, um, the Ithaca Voice video, um, I was able to teach them about this, this, you know, um, the ways in which I break down, um, you know, concepts, the history of Black Lives Matter and its relationship to the anti-lynching movement, but just how to communicate that to really, really young people. So that attracts them, right? There's then that ends up being, um, and many of my students are music students, a great majority of them want to be teachers. We have built in our grad program, our graduate program, I get the grad students. I get all grad students. Those are those are my babies um, in the summer. And so that's that's super fantastic. Um, we are intentional as it relates to recruiting um, and encouraging more students of color, especially black and brown babies to be babies by babies. I mean, college students. Students, yeah, I'm with students you. Too, they know it too. I did the range is like two to, to 24. Um, and uh, to, to, to be a part of our program explicitly, right? Um, uh, the Ed Minor um, in particular, um, but largely I end up also tapping into spaces where I am a faculty mentor, like uh, uh, the Black Student Union, uh, sister, sister to sister. Um, and so I'm pretty intentional I, about who I, want in the space, but then also make space for folks to come in and to learn to, to explore. Um, our young people are accustomed to white teachers. A great majority of teachers throughout this country are in fact white and white women. And so as I engage in this, my goals are to, um, uh, to equip them, situate them to strengthen a deeper level of consciousness so that they are prepared to serve any and every baby that enters this their space. And when I tell you, I, and when they have the summer experience or even a short period of time and they see babies out in the community, out in Ithaca, um, it ends up being transformative. And John and a few others will tell you, I take total credit, when they're amazing, I make them stay. I will find a way or make a way uh, to, to have them stay. So it's a range. I'm real intentional about having yeah. black teachers um, and, 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 and ensuring that our babies see themselves. Um, so that is, that is a central part of it, both and, both and we gotta get more and more and more of these white teachers ready to yeah. not only serve our babies, but to be in spaces where they may be serving nothing but white babies. And I want them to bring this too, to bring it with them because those little white babies that they're serving will be making decisions about black and brown bodies one day. So yeah, yeah. And I think I answered your question, right? I got excited. You definitely again. did. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So. We're going to move to the to the uh, next segment of this. It's uh, it's six thirty four, and okay. Leslie's gonna gonna give some instructions and. Yeah, it's, but thank you, thank you so some, much, um, Dr. Cool. Nia. It was really amazing. Um, so yeah, like we said, you know, we said it was ending at six thirty, and if you gotta go, you gotta go. But we would love it. Anyone who can stay um, for this next bit to have some conversations. Um, and then just um, I also want to mention that on March 15th, there's going to be another in the series of placemakers. And John and I are going to talk about Storyhouse Ithaca and about what inspires us, what our thoughts and ideas and plans are, and, and hope to hear your thoughts and ideas and plans, all of you. So we'll, we'll be sending out information about that. Um, oh, <laughs> I was going to let John tell that, but I told it. Um, <laughs> um, so I'll keep talking. Um, I don't know uh, how to 
turn it off. What's that? Oh, no, maybe not talking to me. Um, okay, so we're gonna do these breakout rooms and the prompts are the, the three questions yeah. that Dr. Nia put in into her talk. Um, so I'll, I'll arrange the breakout rooms and if, but if you wanna talk for a sec about- sure. Yeah, I just wanna bring them back up and 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 just, just cause it's, it's, it's about like being in the space. So with the question the it's, it's just as it is. I mean, for each and every one of us, and this is, is a, a real deep part of my black consciousness work, the consultant work that I've been doing and when I've been going places and, and, and speaking, um, encouraging folks to first start with what you know, what you have been taught. And I really emphasize going as young as you possibly can. So I know that is, that is one of the questions. Like I shared mine, Right. And so we all have our we all have our different relationships with with blackness that are rooted in, um, you know, what we had exposure to either taught directly through family or 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 the media or what have you. So just confronting that. And I oftentimes have people write and I tell them to make it real personal and tell the truth and you don't have to read it out loud. But my favorite is getting people to talk about what that experience is like, too. So you're sharing maybe the answer, it may be your story and keep it fairly, you know, short so that so that folks can really share. But I think what's even more powerful would be um, to to share what even being asked that question is like and going through the process of processing the answer um, that is. One. Did you want me to talk about each of them or just that one? How about just the first one, and then we'll and then we'll like put people in the breakout okay. rooms, and then we'll bring them back and we'll do sure. the others. Sure. So thank you all for 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 agreeing to hang on a little bit longer if you can. Wow. What a joy. My apologies. I definitely didn't make it to all of the different groups. Um, the different breakout rooms, but thank you so much for staying and no judgment if you have to run at all. Um, but I'm truly, truly grateful that you welcomed this, this processing. And what I say is that this is ultimately like a, a prerequisite of any really authentic black consciousness work is just stopping and reflecting on the original, <laughs> the original teachings um and and messages and then looking at um our positioning now where we are and just what 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 happened what was that journey like um the learning the exploration the um yeah i i just appreciate you welcoming the the thinking the processing and for for sharing your stories it's been really great do should we um so we we have a few more minutes. We could go and do another. And I, I, I like stuck both the uh, remaining prompts in one and we could do that or we could just stay here. I and chat. If so, yeah, I think if folks want to chat, let's open it up to all of us. Then that way, if folks want to go, then you don't, you know, then no more, you know, the breakout rooms, I think worked really well and they're great. But at some point they get awkward. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, just like, you know, folks that want to stay and hang and breathe a little bit longer. Beautiful. Um, if you have to go, wonderful. Thank you for, for being here. Um, I'll just continue to say that, yeah, just allowing ourselves to stop and think and reflect on those early years, those early messages are so, so significant. I mean, I get to witness uh, just an incredible journey of very, very young people and what they do with this material, um, how they are able to apply or even think critical, critically about just everything. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm grateful, but it was exciting to hear people tell the truth uh, about how you were reared. So maybe it's not necessarily questions, but maybe folks like didn't get, um, get, able you know weren't able to finish sharing or oh what might be special is sharing what you heard or the impact um what you heard from someone else the ways in which it was similar different just that and or just the concept of even being asked this question um for the few minutes that we have left for folks that are are, are willing 
I'm going to do gallery yeah. so I can see as many yeah, of you. And I just, uh, Hi. We're, we're not quite expert at this yet, but the uh, I've just unspotlighted everyone. So we're all, we can all okay. see each other. So that Great. one face doesn't. And so I can see just... that baby that just. I know. Yeah. I told Mary Baker, I feel like a cat. I'm like, oh, oh hi, hi. <laughs> <laughs> we both just, we're diving in right away. But, um, <laughs> yeah. So what's this, what's this process? been like for you or what are you doing with it miss ann mm. how about you okay oh it looks like i wasn't even muted um well i just wrote in the chat that i always learn and um it's interesting i have answered a question like that question nia for ever since the talking circles which is quite a while ago oh. Um, but it, today was the first time that I took that experience. The experience I described was as a four-year-old in Vicksburg, Mississippi, drinking out of the colored walking water fountain and being whisked, as I said, whisked away by my mother. The thing that I realized today was the silence, with the significance of the silence the significance of the fact that there was no real explanation or discussion that I can remember about why I couldn't drink there. It was because it was for colored people, right? I should understand that. But no, even though my mother was a northerner, no, um, no, probably no capacity to talk about race. Uh, and so I've sort of been trying to talk about it ever since. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anne. Thanks for your sharing. Thank you, Nia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my father, especially my mother too, she has her, her, her dynamic ways, but my father had a way maybe it's about being an educator and sociologist to just I wrote, I just, we, I just remember the permission and space that I had to think critically and talk about so many different interactions because they were constant, right? That we would unpack what just happened, right? I remember being really young, leaving Ithaca College, some event, and I mean, like, grabbed me my arm. I thought I was in trouble. He was like, you were, you are nobody's minority. I'm like, what, what happened? What did I do? What do you mean? And, and that was when like minority, was a central term that was being used. But I remember him explaining to me, you, you are nobody's minority. You know, you are you are a member of the global majority. You were an, of African descent. You're, I remember like the breakdown of it, but just like the, you know, even understanding young that it was presented as a numbers thing, that there was just a few of us, but literally just the other day, I interrupted a, a faculty member who said something about a majority minority school. I'm like, wait a minute. So even when we're 90% of the population, there's still this, this term, right? So I remember that, I remember unpacking pretty heavy stuff, you know, going into black churches, like, why is there a white Jesus? Like, you know, like I was that kid that we, we could do some of that young. So I'm finding it fascinating to work with other adults, parents, um, and model what some of these really intense, really heavy conversations, what it can look, cause they have exposure, they're hearing. They're, you know, they, they see, they're not, you know, but like you said, you know, the, the, the silence, um, sometimes that silence can be really, really powerful. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, just naming that and sharing that. Um, I thank you. Thank you, Anne. I, I think of the silence and the conversations that didn't happen. I'm from Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, and I didn't learn, and I went to school when was in elementary school in the 70s, uh, well, born in 69. Uh, and I didn't know 
until so much later that the schools had been integrated really just a few years before I went to these schools. And there was never, never, never a conversation about that. And I feel like there really should have been. Like that's, you know, that's a, something that we all should have been talking about. I was gonna say, Leslie, Prince George is real black. Yeah. Today, right? He goes from like, like a great majority of my Maryland family um, is Silver Springs or Prince George County, but okay. I think, I think when I was growing up, it was half black and now more than half black. Like, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. I, I will, if I could chime in here, I had the opportunity to speak to Leslie. Hey, Nia. Hello, uh, nice to see you. <laughs> likewise, likewise. Um, I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Nia this past winter as, um, I'm sorry, summer, excuse me, oh at God. the Major Taylor event. Um, and I will say that in my conversations with Leslie, I just mentioned in the breakout that I am from Washington. I grew up in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital um, during the 70s. And one of the points that I made um, that I feel a little naive about um, is that I just recently learned over the last couple of years about integration in the Boston area, as I now am a resident of Connecticut. So a little bit about my background is that I grew up in Washington, D.C., public school system, which was primarily African-American for both elementary and junior high school. But at the same token, I actually had a few of my neighborhood friends, which are one of the few minorities in an all-Black school, which happened to be Caucasian. So we are still friends to this day. So listening, listening to some of their experiences, one of which was from Ohio, one of which is from the Colorado area. So from there, I went to private boarding school in Pennsylvania and then went to Bucknell University. So I'm coming with a little bit of, uh, of a, a very background, but I will say to when I met uh, uh, Dr. Nia, one of the first things I said to her as an African-American man, never being in the Ithaca area, not knowing anything about it, I said to her, did you, did your car break down? Like, why, how are you from here? Like, I, I didn't understand why a person of color would be from or grow up in Ithaca if you weren't going there for school. I just didn't make sense to me because that's just not an area that I would imagine that African-Americans would gravitate towards. But I will say, um, and one of the things that we were talking about, uh, myself, Debbie and, uh, and Leslie in our breakout was this concept of critical race theory, which is kind of an important discussion talking point. But I also will say, and this is just my summation um, of my professional expertise, that everyone that I'm looking at in here that doesn't look like me is a friend of Dr. Nia's. And it speaks to the very nature of what she's talking about. So what, what is my point? Unfortunately, when these discussion topics come up, all too often we have friends within our community. So I don't need a Michael, Ben, I don't need a Jonathan to be here. I don't need a Debbie or an Ann or a Marisa or all of you. I need the, the people that are friends of yours that wouldn't gravitate to this type of discussion to participate, to become educated, to explore this other conversation that Dr. Nee is talking about. And that's where I think the change that she's um, uh, you know, trying to illuminate really will become a, a realization. And until that day, we're just gonna keep having the same conversations with the same people. And we need talking points from those other individuals that aren't um, participants. So I'm gonna shut up, that's it. Um, and we we absolutely wanna like grow these conversations. Um, let me, I mean, Dr. Nia, if you're willing to hang on for a few minutes, that's great, but it is 7.04, sure. so. Sure, um, I wanted to throw one yeah, thing in there though. Deborah, yeah, yeah, definitely. Hi, just one thing. I just say, oh, good to see you. It's Congratulations on your, the, the Graham baby. I know I could talk a lot about that, but let me stick to the topic. How about, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Bell Sherman, I want you to know at 1215 Thursday is um, having all the first graders, about 50 of them made signs, um, stop racism, Black Lives Matter. We're gonna have a protest chant. Our principal authorized it. We practice it every morning. We'll sing, we shall overcome. We're teaching all the kids about participation in anti-racism marches. And um, if you have an opportunity to, it'll be outdoors. I know it's going to be raining, but we already scheduled and we invited Lily Talcott and some other people from the um, uh, ICSD administration to come. And some of them might, even if it's raining. So we'd have to bring umbrellas. But Thank you so much. Um, 
uh, we have to find a way to put, put some plastic on their signs. You know, we're practicing all that, but we didn't change the date. So just to let you know, it's kind of exciting. Um, all the first graders will be doing that, mostly in the playground, but a little bit inside Bell Sherman. Yeah, definitely get a, a, re a recording of their engagement. For oh, sure. that's a great idea. We'll have yeah, to get, get somebody to move on that. Yeah, okay. document that. Awesome. No, so I mean, I guess it's at this point where we thank everybody, right, Leslie? And really thank you so much for, for, for staying, for, for connecting and no judgment for folks that, that had to get off. You know, Zoom is, is the thing. Some of you all have been on this all day. <laughs> so, um, so it's nice to just give you the space to have an absolutely beautiful evening, but to come back. Um, you know, March 22nd, we'll dive a little deeper. I think um, some of the questions or what the feedback that we get will, will help um, in some of the decision making for the 22nd, but it would be ideal and beautiful to, to be in person if that's possible, but we'll keep it vibrant and colorful if we're on Zoom as well. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Mia, so much. Thank you all of you for coming. This was really Thank great. you very, very much. Bye. Bye. Yes, take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Yes, have a everyone. lovely Bye. day. Bye. Leslie, this is for you. Take, take them out with the music. Oh, yeah, the music, the music. <laughs> Yay. 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 <laughs> so dope. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I, I, really, I, I was really interested to see what he had to say, to be honest. I was waiting for him to comment. Who's that? You know, the baby. Oh, oh, I know. <laughs> that baby, that baby's gonna have lots to say. I know lots that. That's a, I'd like to take him that young. That's about how young I want. Yep. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Thank you all so much. Terrell, thank you for coming. I really appreciate hey, it. I was oh, so excited to see. I was like, oh wait, that's no, I so I him. I called Gina and you you never met Gina. She didn't make it to the boat that night, but Gina was there. Kurt, actually, Glenn, I actually messaged Glenn. So if he tried to tell you that he remembered, he didn't remember. I actually messaged him. <laughs> And then, um, and then Kelly, when she was commenting, she was actually literally on the bike because yeah, of the contest going it. on. So oh, I, I messaged it. her. I'm so yeah. grateful that you all joined. That is just like, absolutely, like, you know, well, great and thing. actually I will share this with you. And I sure. think this is important for Jonathan and Leslie to hear this. Sure. Yeah. I got to say that as a person of color and, and where we are, and this is kind of to your point, what's disappointing to me as a African-American male, when I came on screen to see the topic that we're talking about but I don't see faces that look like mine. Oh. And, and I know Nia, I said, she already knows where I'm going with this. Sure. And I literally was texting people saying, hey, we got to support our sister Nia. She's doing something that's important that we need to you know, really support her. Yeah. And not that necessarily we need the messaging, but we need to show that support in our own community. But more importantly, I got the same feeling that when the, um, the help came out in theaters, literally that week was opening week. I went to see it on like a weeknight. Yes. That theater in my town was packed. When the lights came on, I was shocked to see that over 90% of the people were Caucasian. Yeah. And I said this to somebody who I went with who actually was Caucasian. I said, this is a Black movie. She goes, no, it's not. I'm like, yeah, it is. This is a Black movie. This is not a Caucasian movie. You know, uh, Black theme is, is kind of my point. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was kind of making the points that I was making that you know what? I see Leslie and Jonathan as allies. We don't we we don't need the Leslies and Jonathans on there <laughs> per se. I don't mean that, that not to participate, sure. but we need the Mites and the Toms and the you know the other people out there mm -hmm. to and, and that's where progress really will. Well, I will begin to believe that progress will really um, ensue. So no, I really appreciate that, and it's real, right? You know, yes, ma'am. About circumstances where I've gone on to, to do some consulting or what have you and um, the like mandated where people are mandated and that's an interesting experience as well. Um, when folks, you know, choose to be somewhere that, or don't choose and then um, just finding creative ways of enrolling and engaging folks. So I, I you know, incorporate this work in any and all of my teaching, um, but you're, you're, you're right um, and this is recorded, which is great too. So there may also be some creative ways to play with pieces of it too, Leslie, for I'm learning from the young people about the Instagram and, <laughs> and I know, I know, right? Uh, and, and, you know, different ways of like communicating some key messages, but ultimately, yeah, yeah, the transformation will come from folks that are out of the comfort zone significantly.